as we all know very well, deer eat everything. They mow down our gardens, our hosta, arborvitae, tomatoes, oak trees, just about anything they can get their hands on. They also eat things that we might not think of right away, such as birds, clean air, clean water, other deer, money, and even human health and happiness. And those are the things that I'm going to focus on in this presentation. First of all, deer eat birds. Not to say that they're carnivores, not yet, but rather, this is a very simplified ecological food pyramid. On the base are forest plants, which are eaten by deer and insects. The insects in turn are eaten by birds. Now, deer eat everything, which means that they are generalists. Generalists can eat many different native species and can also adapt to eat non-native species. For example, deer eat many native species of oak and lots of other native plants as well. They can also adapt to eat non-native things such as hosta and arborvitae. On the other hand, many of our native species of insects are specialists. The specialists can only eat one or a few species of native plants and very rarely adapt to eat non-native species. For example, monarch caterpillars can eat several species of milkweed, but not much else. In fact, nothing else. Goldenrod is another native plant that is host to hundreds of species of caterpillars, and many of those species of caterpillars specialize on it. One pair of chickadees needs 5,000 insects to raise one clutch of chicks. That's a lot of insects. And this becomes a problem for the birds because when deer eat more than their fair share, fair share of vegetation because they're overpopulated, that leaves very little food for the rest of the species that rely on native, plant, on native plants. And as a result of this, our native insects begin to experience population declines which in turn cause starvation and decline for our native species of songbirds. Deer also eat deer. Now a balanced ecosystem can support a healthy number of animals, as we see here. However, when organisms become overpopulated, they put an unnatural strain on natural resources, which for normal population numbers, the vegetation could sustain a healthy number of deer. However, when deer are overpopulated, they eat too much plants, too many plants, and this causes starvation and sickness for them as well. Now, deer will occasionally wander into neighborhood gardens, but the number of deer that we're seeing these days wandering through the streets and the extent of their damage indicate severe overpopulation. By overcrowding the parks and shoving an unnatural number of deer into them, we're turning them into deer feedlots and breeding disease and starvation among the deer and among ourselves, as we will see later. If we reduce the number of deer, both they and the ecosystem will be healthier. A healthy forest ecosystem filters air and water. Dirty air with pollutants in it is filtered through the leaves of the trees, and which produce, in turn, clean air for us. Also, when it rains, rainwater will run onto city streets and pick up pollutants such as motor oil and pollutants from trash. This runoff, when it runs into the forests, is filtered through the roots of the trees and down into the soil, and this produces clean drinking water. Trees also act as carbon sinks, which means that they take carbon dioxide in in the process of photosynthesis and store it in their trunks. Trees can live a long time, so this means that the carbon dioxide is essentially locked into their tissue. This means that forests provide an essential barrier against global warming. However, when deer eat too many plants, we, we're seeing in our forests now that they're eating too many saplings, which means that the forest isn't regrowing. Dead trees aren't going to be replaced. So our forests are becoming less and less healthy and there are less and less trees, which means that our dirty air will no longer be cleaned and the dead trees will no longer be replaced and sequester carbon dioxide. When trees die and decompose, carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere, 
And if those dead trees aren't replaced, then these unhealthy forests are actually acting as a, a source of carbon dioxide, worsening global climate change. Also, when there aren't healthy tree roots to hold soil in place, then rainwater is more likely to simply run off the land. And this means that trees are no, the forests are no longer cleaning our drinking water. In addition, in a healthy forest ecosystem, there are a few pests. However, in an unbalanced ecosystem where an organism is overpopulated, the pests of an organism also become overpopulated. This increases the likelihood of spreading these pests and diseases to humans. We see this in Pittsburgh, Lyme's disease cases are on the rise. A healthy ecosystem contains scavengers that clean up dead animals, and this is a good thing. Otherwise, there would be dead animals all around, and we wouldn't want that. They would spread disease. However, when there are too many dead animals as a result of overpopulation, there will also be an overabundance of scavengers, such as rats and turkey vultures, and sometimes these scavengers can become pests. There may also be more dead animals than the cleanup crews can handle, which breed disease and spread it to humans. As a result of deer overpopulation, deer will just begin dying. They'll start appearing in our streets and in our backyards and along trails, and that will breed disease, it'll become a problem, and it'll also just be kind of gross. Deer car collisions also cost $4.8 billion in damages every year in the US, as well as over 200 human deaths. So deer also can directly cause death as opposed to simply spreading disease to us. Studies have shown that people are happier with trees around, as, and as mentioned before, as, deer eat too, as overpopulated deer eat too many saplings, the forests are beginning to thin, and that means that there will be less tree, fewer trees in the future. As a quick recap, deer eat birds because over, overpopulated deer eat more than their fair share of vegetation, and this leaves little room for caterpillars that rely on these plants, causing the birds that eat the caterpillars to begin to die off. Deer eat deer. Deer overpopulation causes the deer to starve and breed disease among themselves and to humans, which impacts human health. Deer eat the trees that provide us with clean water, clean air, a steady climate, and happiness. Now, deer overpopulation is not a new problem. Yellowstone National Park had a similar problem with elk. We can see in this diagram that soon after people began to settle the West, they saw apex predators such as wolves and coyotes and mountain lions as a threat to their livelihoods and their safety. So as a result of this, they began to kill apex predators such as wolves and mountain lions. And soon after wolves were eradicated from Yellowstone National Park, we can see that deer, sorry, elk populations begin to skyrocket in the park. However, after wolves were reintroduced in the 90s, the elk populations soon began to decline to healthy numbers. So what can we do? Obviously, it wouldn't be a super popular alternative to introduce coyotes and wolves into our parks, and that could have the potential to cause at least perceived dangers to humans. So our viable options are contraceptives and sharpshooting. Contraceptives involve injecting either does or bucks with chemicals to make them infertile. This leads to a reduction in the number of young deer. However, when the doses of contraceptives are administered to the deer, then the deer will expel these chemicals, some of them drastically unchanged into the ecosystem. And these chemicals can eventually enter our groundwater and streams. So the contraceptives and birth control that we're administering, th that we would be administering to the deer would end up, we would end up drinking them. In addition, children like to play in streams and rivers. And so they would come into direct contact with these chemicals as well. The alt so contraceptives, are popular because they don't involve killing deer. However, it takes many years, they take many years to become effective because 
the current population of deer has to die before we see a reduction in population. Also, contraceptives inject chemicals into the environment and drinking water. They are also very expensive, ranging from $500 to $1,000 per dose, and doses have to be renewed annually. The alternative to contraceptives is sharpshooting. Now, this involves having skilled hunters come in and hunt the deer, which leads to a reduction in deer populations. Sharpshooting has a number of pros, including being quickly effective, less expensive, it doesn't poison the environment, and can provide sustainable meat to charities. However, people often oppose it because it involves directly harvesting deer. What people often don't understand is that sharpshooting is actually the more humane option of the two because contraceptives don't deal with the problem very effectively. And so this means that while the contraceptives are having effect, which can take tens of years, which can take decades, the deer and our birds are continuing to face severe starvation. In addition, humans are continuing to get sick. So even after, even if we came in and took action in the parks today and actively decreased the deer herds, this wouldn't lead to necessarily to an increase in the forest health. More steps are needed. So I've come up with a suggested method called the three R's of renewal. It comprises reduce, remove, and renew. First of all, reducing the deer population gives the forest a chance to regrow. Then we need to remove the invasive, that are, the invasive plants that are already rampant in our parks. This will give native plants that butterflies, bees, and insects rely on a better chance of survival. And finally, renewing the forest ecosystem will involve taking native plant seeds and seedlings from elsewhere and transplanting them into the parks. Numerous studies have shown that even excluding deer from a forest ecosystem that has been overbrowsed for, say, 20 years doesn't lead to an increase in native plant cover. So we'll need to take seedlings and seeds in from elsewhere that has healthy populations of native plants and transplant them into the parks. However, this, if we do this, this will lead to very healthy forest ecosystems and uh, renewed parks for us all. And I've put together some resources for you if you want to do some more research on your own. First of all, the Audubon Society of Western Pennsylvania is a great resource, and especially its native plant nursery at Beechwood Farms, a little bit north of town. It's a beautiful space with lots of native plants, and you can buy your own there if you want to introduce natives to your yard. Penn State Extension, it's a bit of a bear to get to, but if you can get there, it has tons of great resources such as websites and websites and webinars that you can sign up for if you want to learn more. The Lady Bird Johnson Foundation, wildflower.org plant database. So you can go onto this website and search for native plants and it'll come up. So for example, if you searched blue vervain or verbena hostata, it would come up with this page. This is only the beginning. It has light requirements, water requirements, what, what native species of insects can eat it and what it's a host plant for and many, many other great things. And finally, I think my favorite resource would be Doug Tallamy. He's a conservation writer based in Western Pennsylvania and he's written numerous books, including Nature's Best Hope, which I think is a great one-stop shopping way to learn about how to serve native species in your yard. There are also two great webinars on the National Wildlife Federation. So they had him come in and do two talks on native plants and these are great and I'd, I'd highly suggest watching them. <laughs>